Welcome to the second half of Tribes of the Great Plains. It is, uh, it's unfortunate that we're having to, to change over like this partway through the semester to, to online. Uh, however, in the case of, of our particular class, and this isn't true with my others, but in this one, it's, uh, it's the ideal time uh, to, to switch over. We were at the ideal point, right? Because we had spent the first half talking about prehistory and laying out a lot of uh, cultural things and religious things. And we had gotten up to roughly the 1830s, 1840s, at which point, uh, back when we thought we were going to be reconvening in person, um, I told you that the second half is going to start there and it's going to be more of a chronological narrative. So in some ways that fits better with the approach that we're now being forced by circumstance uh, to take our, our post-corona, post-COVID uh, response. So uh, we're going to pick up with the uh, Southern Plains uh, in the late 1830s, and then we're going to move forward all the way into the 21st century. How we're going to do this is that sometimes I'm going to have a slide up like this one that's, that's all text. And sometimes when I do that, I'm going to actually pull up an image on the screen while I'm talking about the text. That way you're not, not just staring at some text, but you can go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this available as both PowerPoint and on video. So on the video, you can go back and pause on that text screen uh, when you're, say, studying for an exam or something. All right. So that's how we're doing it. Let's go ahead and start doing it. Uh, at, the end, at the end of our first part, which uh, is not available on, on video because we did it live in person, but at the end of that first part, we had, uh, we had talked a little bit about the problems that arose when the, uh, the five quote-unquote civilized tribes and other southern and midwestern tribes were removed uh, during the uh, period known as the Trail of Tears, and they were all put into Indian territory, which on the map here is part of that big area called unorganized territory. Um, what would come to be known specifically as Indian territory and where the five tribes were put is right there um, where the first part of the word united is, where it's light blue in eastern Oklahoma, basically from the Red River in the south up to right above where the uh, Arkansas and Cimarron Rivers uh, fork off, kind of even with the top border of, of Arkansas. So those tribes were put there. However, unfortunately, um, for both them and the people who were already there, there were people already there, uh, including uh, the Osage, who uh, were living in part of that area and uh, were somewhat, um, well, um, not exactly thrilled to have thousands of more people put in their backyard, basically. And then just to the west of there, as you can see on the map, it says Kiowa. To the west of that, that's what's now Western Oklahoma. Uh, the Kiowa and, and the Comanches uh, were there, and that led to some, some friction between the newly removed tribes and, and those tribes to their west, uh, who uh, started, started raiding uh, the, the Cherokees and Choctaws and et cetera, which, uh, well, that's, that's problematic if you're one of those uh, tribes from the east who has already been removed, in many cases forcibly, and sent on a forced march to this new land. And when you get there, there's people already there that are trying to kill you. So uh, you could imagine uh, what an unwelcome uh, ch chain of events that was. Well, as part of the treaty uh, that... Um, was the basis, the treaties, uh, the basis of removing those tribes. The U.S. government promised to give them land 
west of the Mississippi, and they were giving them that land in eastern Oklahoma. And they also promised to provide them with protection from the Indian tribes who were already there. And so uh, they started building forts. Uh, they built uh, Fort Gibson was one of the big ones in what is now Oklahoma. Also Fort Smith, which is in Arkansas, but it's right on the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. Well, in 1835, the U.S. Army, commanded by Colonel Henry Dodge, led a large force of dragoons into western Oklahoma, uh, coming out of Fort Gibson. What is a dragoon? That's a word that you will encounter from time to time, especially if you're reading um, U.S. history and military history. A dragoon basically uh, means cavalry. So uh, a cavalry a unit, a large, large number of cavalrymen uh, led out uh, to the territory of the Kiowas and the Comanches and at a place called Camp Holmes, uh, Dodge uh, and, and others uh, got several tribes to come together and agree to a, uh, a treaty of, uh, of friendship to stop fighting, uh, to stop fighting one another, basically to get the, uh, the tribes in western Oklahoma and the Osage to stop attacking the newcomers. Um, this, uh, this treaty involved the Comanche, the Wichita, the, uh, the Osage and the Quapaw, who were the tribes that had already been there. And it involved the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Creek, uh, and the uh, Seneca, a uh, group of Seneca had been removed there. Seneca are part of the Iroquois nation. In return, one of the things the United States was supposed to be getting was a guarantee of safe passage on the Santa Fe Trail. Now, if you look at the map, uh, you can see the Santa Fe Trail in red. It was first opened in 1821. And essentially, uh, it goes from western Missouri, uh, from Westport, Missouri, and then it goes through that unorganized territory, skirting along the top of uh, the Comancheria, the Comanche and Kiowa uh, territory, and... Uh, Sometimes, I guess, when they were feeling especially brave and wanted to take a shortcut, the Cimarron route. Uh, and it winds up in Santa Fe. Why did they want to wind up in Santa Fe? Because Santa Fe was the northernmost point on El Camino Royal, uh, which is the uh, road up from Mexico City. Uh, Santa Fe, at that time, was owned by Mexico. Uh, so if... Uh, well, when this trail was established, the Santa Fe Trail, that means that the United States will be able to directly tie into trade from Mexico. So all the stuff coming up, not just from Mexico, but other parts of Central America. So Santa Fe was a very important uh, trade location. Notice up in the upper left-hand corner in the Northwest, there's a place called Bent's Old Fort. Uh, it's right there in the middle of the mountain route of the Santa Fe Trail in what would later become southeastern Colorado. Bent's Fort was a trading post. Uh, it was an adobe uh, trading post, and it really was laid out, as you can see, like a fort. It was owned and operated by William Bent, who was uh, born in St. Louis in 1809. So he's around 30, uh, in his late 20s, early 30s, when he establishes this place. He had gone out west. He had uh, um, married a Cheyenne woman. Owl woman was her name. And as was the custom among the, uh, the Cheyenne, if, uh, if you'll recall from from little big man. He also wound up marrying, at the same time, her sisters, named Eagle Woman and Island. Uh, he, was, uh, he was adopted into the tribe, uh, and he had a very close relationship with uh, various Cheyenne leaders. Actually, the, uh, the father of Owl Woman, whose name was, her father's name was, I think, White Thunder, and her mother's name was Tall Woman. White Thunder 
was the uh, the guardian of the sacred arrow bundle. And you, you remember how important that was. Well, Bent set up this, this trading post and various different tribes came in, representatives of different tribes, came in and he traded with them. Uh, and it's right here along that route to Santa Fe. So he's also got people coming uh, from the uh, from the U.S. to the uh, Mexican uh, trade destination of Santa Fe and vice versa. So he's got a lot of goods and he's also got various native groups coming in. And, well, he's friends with the Cheyenne, who by this time were allied with the Arapaho. So there he is. He's got an in with the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. Uh, he also befriends the Comanches and Kiowas, who don't think too, too highly at that point of the Cheyenne and Arapaho. They were actually enemies. This is the Southern Cheyenne, Southern Arapaho, and they were fighting and had been fighting. And uh, Bent kind of got, uh, well, he got a little bit bent because of this, because it was difficult for him to do business when he's got uh, Kiowas and Comanches coming in, and he's got Cheyennes and Arapahoes coming in, and they don't like each other, and they're fighting one another, and that just that's bad for business. So because he had uh, the respect of both sides, he actually had uh, leaders from, from both sides come to his fort uh, and sit down and negotiate, and they came up with a peace agreement in 1840. And from that time forward, uh, for the next... 30-some years, 35 years, however, however long that uh, all those groups maintained their freedom on the plains, the Comanches and Kiowas and Southern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho were allies. And this is where it started. William Bent had several children by uh, each of his three wives. One of them was, was this guy, George, George Bent, son of uh, William Benton, Owl Woman, the first of the sisters that he married. Uh, George was also known as Homayake, or Beaver. So he's, he's half Cheyenne and, and half Anglo, uh, but uh, this makes him a, uh, considered a member of the, uh, member of the, the Cheyenne. Um, he grew up at Bent's Fort, uh, interacting with all the different kinds of people who came through there. He was born in 1843. When the Civil War started, he was uh, 18 years old. Now, his father, William, had been born in St. Louis, but uh, William's family had recently immigrated there right before he was born in 1809 from Virginia. So they had these connections with the South. And George Bent went down to... Uh, went over to Missouri and joined up uh, in a Confederate regiment there and uh, fought through most of the rest of the, uh, the Civil War as a Confederate soldier. However, near the end of the war, right at the end of the war, being somewhat disillusioned, uh, he abandoned uh, his father's way of doing things and went and lived with his mother's people the Cheyenne, and he remained with them for the rest of his long life. Um, I said he did this before the end of the war. Uh, that means that uh, he joined the Cheyenne uh, just in time to be present at Sand Creek, where that massacre happened toward the end of the Civil War. We'll be talking about that in great detail later. Uh, he was one of the survivors of that. And uh, he joined the Dog Soldier Military Society of the Cheyenne after that. And so did uh, his brother Charles, who actually wound up getting killed a couple of years later in a raid. George Bent, or Beaver, um, participated as a Cheyenne Dog Soldier in 27 different war parties. Uh, here he is in the photograph with his wife Magpie. Later on, when he was in his late 40s, he was at Wounded Knee, uh, which we'll be talking about that also in some detail later, but you're already familiar with it. So he survived that too. And he has uh, some very harrowing eyewitness accounts of, of both 
of those massacres. He also was, uh, because bear in mind uh, his background, the way he was raised, he spoke English perfectly and uh, he could uh, understand uh, and, and operate in both worlds. He was interviewed extensively by the historian George Grinnell. Uh, some of you may be doing your research papers on the uh, Comanche people. And if you are, you will come across the name of George Grinnell. He was one of the first uh, historians to write extensively about that tribe, although it's always good to get more recent uh, efforts. Also, James Mooney, uh, an anthropologist who worked for, I think, the Smithsonian, a very important name uh, in uh, anthropology, late 19th century, and in American Indian studies, because he spent a lot of time interviewing um, Lakota Sioux, and as you can see with, with George Bent, Cheyenne, also Cherokee people, uh, and a lot of the oral history of all those peoples that we have, um, you're able to look up in your research because James Mooney wrote it down when they told it to him. So George Bent was uh, an invaluable source of cultural information about the Cheyenne people. Well, we just kind of wandered all over the 19th century for a, for a few minutes there talking about George Bent, but now let's get back to the 1830s and the, uh, the Southern Plains, specifically the Comanches. And we're going to talk about a place called Fort Parker, which wasn't a town, it was a little settlement uh, about a hundred miles south of Dallas that uh, a very large extended family from Illinois had established. They had uh, uh, the, the patriarch of the family, uh, John Parker, and uh, his, uh, his, his children and their spouses and their kids and a few other families that had joined them. And they came uh, and they uh, uh, decided to come start, start a new life in Texas, kind of at a bad time because this is May 1836, three months after the Alamo. So there's a lot of stuff going on anyway. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they get there and they build their cabins and then they build a stockade, a wooden fence, a palisade around their cabins. Uh, so it wasn't a large settlement. It was just a handful of families. And uh, on that, that day in, in May, they were attacked from anywhere from 100 to maybe as many as 500 Comanches and Kiowas who just kind of swarmed down on them very quickly. Um, and uh, some, of the, some of the people, uh, some of the Anglo people managed to, managed to escape, uh, but five of the Parker men were killed. And two women and three children were captured Actually, uh, not just five, six people in all. There was a teenage girl, but she managed to get away from her captors. So, so five were taken away, including, as, as illustrated in this drawing, a little girl who was eight or nine years old named Cynthia Ann Parker. She was one of the grandchildren of patriarch John Parker, uh, who had brought the family there from Illinois. She was captured and taken uh, to the, uh, the Comanche camps, and she was adopted into the tribe. Of the other four, all of them were eventually returned to their, to their family for, for trade uh, for Comanche captives. But uh, this little girl, uh, so far as uh, she was concerned for the rest of her life, was Comanche. Um, in fact, she... She forgot a lot uh, of her English, though she didn't forget it completely. Cynthia Ann Parker. Cynthia Ann gained the new Comanche name Nadua, which means one who has been found. So she spent the rest of her childhood as a Comanche. And then when she was of age, she got married to a Comanche warrior named... Uh, uh, Peta Nakona, uh, which means lone wanderer. He was the uh, he was the son 
of a famous Comanche uh, chieftain named Iron Jacket, uh, who was known for wearing an old piece of uh, Spanish armor. So Peta Nakona and Nadua had three children. The oldest was a son named Quana. Uh, then next, another son named Pecos or Peanut. And then a much younger daughter named Topsana uh, or, or Prairie Flower. Well, in 1861, the uh, uh, the band that Peta Nakona was part of was raided by Texas Rangers, and this uh, this company was led by the famous Texas Ranger and cattleman Charlie Goodnight. Uh, so they swept through. Peta Nakona and his two sons managed to escape, but many of the women and children were captured, and in fact, sixteen Comanche women were killed. However. Uh, when they came to Nadua and saw that she had uh, light-colored hair and blue eyes, they, they quickly realized that she was, she was not Comanche by birth, that she was a white woman. And they did some math as to who some various missing people were and came to the conclusion this must be the famous missing Cynthia Ann Parker. So they, uh, they captured her and her daughter, Topsana. And uh, this is the two of them in a photograph taken right after, right after she was captured in 1861. Well, uh, she, was, uh, she was claimed by distant relatives, uh, another part of the Parker family. And she was taken to live with them along with her little daughter. And uh, it was in all the newspapers and it was, uh, uh, it was greatly celebrated that this long lost daughter of early Texas had been returned. But thing is, she didn't want to be returned because she didn't think of herself as a, as a uh, missing white girl from Texas. She thought of herself as a Comanche. And she had a Comanche husband and she had Comanche sons and a Comanche daughter. And she wanted to be let go so that she could go and rejoin her family. But she was not allowed to. She kept trying to run away with her daughter and they kept catching her and bringing her back. Well, uh, after a couple of years in captivity, uh, which is ironic, right? Because from the perspective of her relatives, she had been rescued from captivity, but actually she is now in captivity with them. After a couple of years, she received word that uh, her second son, Pecos, had died of smallpox and he was 12, 13 years old, maybe, at most. Uh, she received word that, uh, that her husband had been killed in battle against Apaches. Then, Topsana, prairie flower, got sick and it turned into pneumonia and the little girl died. So now, all that uh, Nadua slash Cynthia Ann Parker has left is her son. And she... Uh, again, was begging to be released so she could go find her son, who by this time, probably um, around 18 or so, he was in his mid-teens when she was captured. Um, in fact, Kwana, the name means smell or odor. It was, it was common practice among the Comanches, like a lot of other Plains tribes, that you have uh, one name as a child, and then when you earn an adult name, then you get a new name by which you will be known. For example, the famous Lakota Sioux leader, Sitting Bull, Tatanka Iotake, spent his childhood uh, going by the name Slow, right? So these childhood names aren't always necessarily um, all that flattering. But because, because her son Kwana loved her so much, he refused to ever go by any name other than what she had called him, Kwana. Uh, she was not allowed to rejoin him. And eventually, uh, disconsolate, she stopped eating. She went on a hunger strike and died around 1870. 
her surviving son, Quana, um, went on by the 1870s, by the time he was around 30 years old, uh, went on to become the leader of the Quahati Band of Comanches. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot about, uh, about him and that period later on. Uh, these are actual photographs of him. He remained uh, leader of the Quahati Band well into the, uh, well, up into the 20th century uh, after they were confined to, uh, to Oklahoma. So he went by Quana as a, as a warrior uh, and as leader of the band when they were fighting. Once confined to the reservation, he went beyond just keeping his childhood name to honor his mother. He also started using his mother's last name. So he is known in history as Quana Parker, one of, um, one of the most famous Comanche leaders of the 19th century. By the way, there's a, there's a very poignant and powerful short story, work of short fiction, that is, that is based on the story of Cynthia Ann Parker called Lost Sister. It came out back in the 1950s, won the Spur Award. Uh, it is by Dorothy Johnson, one of the all-time great Western authors. She also wrote short stories called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance and A Man Called Horse. Uh, and I think that Lost Sister ranks right up there with the best of her work for the, uh, for the power behind it. So I, I highly recommend that if you're interested. There's also a novel, um, a historical novel. It's kind of uh, framed as a romance novel, but it's more of a historic novel uh, called Ride the Wind by Lucia Robeson, L-U-C-I-A. Uh, and I highly recommend that one as well. Uh, in addition to the many great actual historical works, not fiction, that you can read about the Parkers. Her surviving son, Quana, um, went on by the 1870s, by the time he was around 30 years old, uh, went on to become the leader of the Quahati Band of Comanches. We're going to be talking a lot about uh, about him and that period later on. Uh, these are actual photographs of him. He remained uh, leader of the Quahati Band well into the uh, well up into the 20th century uh, after they were confined to uh, to Oklahoma. So he went by Quana as a as a warrior uh, and as leader of the band when they were fighting. Once confined to the reservation, he went beyond just keeping his childhood name to honor his mother. He also started using his mother's last name. So he is known in history as Quana Parker, one of, um, one of the most famous Comanche leaders of the 19th century. 